Okay, uh, I will call to order the staff review meeting for the Murray City Planning Commission. It is 6 p.m. on Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. President, we have Commissioners Jake Pearson, um, Travis Nay, Lisa Makavich, Ned Hacker, Sue Wilson is joining us on Zoom, and Jeremy Lowry should be here momentarily. From staff, we have Zach Smallwood and Susan Nixon and Jill Critchfield. Um, so we will begin with our agenda items. There were um, no minutes for this packet, so we will go to our conflicts of interest. Did anyone have any conflicts of interest about our agenda items tonight? Nope. All right. Nope. Great. Um, did we all have a chance to review the finding of fact? There were four, three, four? Four. Yeah. I thought they all looked good. I didn't see any changes or okay question on yes on the fashion place Larry Miller one. Um, we did that for two years yes I've got those prepared if you want me to do them or if Ned wants to whatever works yeah we specifically called out two years on that one originally it was going to be an unlimited and we brought them back to two no, years we said not unlimited Two years is what they had previously had, right? So we were, yeah. Yeah. Also, um, just for the commissioners, we need to make sure that when you guys talk, get pretty close to the mic. Um, otherwise, you can't hear very well on that. So if you can hear yourself here, right. you should be able to hear yourself. <laughs> that They should be able to hear you on the Zoom meeting. So just, just as a note, because Sue probably can't hear you either. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions about those findings of fact? I thought they look great. So let's move to our um, agenda item number four, Ingenuity Inc. and a conditional use permit. Yep, that would be me. So yes, Ingenuity Inc. Requesting approval for a tattoo shop in uh, one of the Carco Industrial Parks, 150 West, 4800 South, number 29. You probably thought this was going to be for auto sales. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Based on the location. <laughs> Every now and then we get something that's different. So it's just a one artist tattoo shop. She may potentially have another uh, artist down the road, but she's just leasing 585 square feet. Um, it's, she does have five designated parking stalls. Parking requires four minimum for her use, and she's got five. There is the one ADA stall that's in front of the garage overhead door will need to either be eliminated or moved elsewhere, or they will have to lock up and block off the garage door, which I don't think So um, did you do a site visit on yes. this? Yes. And the aerial photo shows no space like her marked off spaces i'll have other double parked cars in them <laughs> so, oh i did go out yes th so that aerial is year, probably year old. or two uh, old okay but when i was down there actually i have some pictures there um okay there was just you're right they just <laughs> had the one row right in front of the okay. unit and then they had yeah you're right and the other two over on the west side is same thing kind of double parked they had them reserved with the concrete block. Good idea. So <laughs> save those parking spots. <laughs> save those parking spots. So, yes. Yeah, so um, Ms. they meet the parking requirements. There's Ms. no Ms. landscaping. Ms. Nixon, can I ask you a quick yeah. question about the parking while you're on parking? Sure. Um, it's a comment discussion. Um, in our packet, we said the applicant will need to the applicant will need to work with the staff to strap stripe the parking spaces and blah blah blah. I, I wonder, I think we talk about this sometimes, and um, should we just, could we, do we need to identify who? Because I feel like sometimes, do we need to identify who's responsible for that? I mean, meaning someone oh. who's not in this process often might think, whoo, the owner's off the hook, the applicant has to do it, you know, or, and if we just said they need to be striped, then, then that we wouldn't be given responsibility or taking yeah. anyone. Sure, you, yeah. Good but idea. isn't there in the conditional use permit or in the conditions as well? Yeah, well, that's yes. what I mean. In the conditions, is it state? Oh, yeah, number it. four. Number four. The applicant shall. How does. Um, well, typically the applicant or the property owner, but you can certainly change that to be more of a generic, and then we can 
work with them and or let them work it out amongst themselves, the owner or the applicant. Um, sometimes the owner isn't too willing to do it, so the applicant wants to get going so fast. What's the overall condition of the law and the striping currently? It's actually it's actually there. It's just faded. It's just faded. But and, you can and, still see it. It's not like some of the other Garco properties where you just pretend yes, that there's you, a line. You can, and, yeah, I have some photos. And yes, you can see them. They're, they're, they are faded, but you can okay. you can make them out. So it's yes. not really surfacing or anything like that. It's just faded paint. Yeah. Just and then maybe part of that idea was to kind of address the ADA stall that either needs to be moved or somehow remedied. I guess you know. part of my question is, I feel like that comes up kind of often where we kind of identify who's responsible for it in situations where we could leave it open because I feel like it, by identifying who's responsible for it, sometimes we're letting somebody off the hook. All so. right, right. Good idea. If you want to make it more, sure, that's a good idea, actually. We'll, we'll try to remember that in the future and make it more generic. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. And that's great. Any other questions about this application? Anything else we need to know? Um, we kind of skipped from parking. <laughs> oh yeah, right, right. Uh, no, so I, other than that, it meets it meets all the codes, and we'll make sure that all those issues, like the parking, striping, etc., will be addressed before she gets her business. Did we license. get a new fire official? Fire official? Yeah, I just noticed that no. the conditions for, oh. are, seem to be a little more <laughs> robust than they have been in the they past. Take turns and depending on someone's on vacation or whatever. No, we still have uh, Joey Middleman still okay. the one who usually does it. Um, and then depending on if he's on vacation, then one of the marshals, fire marshals, fill in for him. So there, yeah, and there is one that's a little more detailed on the requirements. So okay. yes, I have another question. So on, on landscape, it just says it's adjacent to the street. It doesn't say that there's enough there or they need more. So uh, um, is it good. It's good because the frontage is about 1,200 feet away from this particular unit. So it's kind of hard to justify them bringing it up to code when they're... It's on a private drive, right? Yeah. Yeah. On a private drive. And the, and the public road is 1,200 feet away. So, yeah. Good. Hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. Great. Um, then our next item is Red Rock Winchester Condominium Subdivision Amendment. Yes, that's kind of an over overstatement for really what in reality <laughs> is happening. Uh -huh. mo um, this application is for the condominiums, which was condominiumized in 2018. Uh, they recorded a plot, divided the, the units into 12 units at the property at, sorry, 746 East Winchester. The owner um, of a couple of the units uh, wants to reconfigure the common wall, which is kind of like the lot line, and with the intention of selling unit 220, and he will remain in 230. But because it is a platted condominium, he does have to go through this process to amend that and update the uh, declaration and CCNRs, which he's done. So um, this is almost, I hate to say, a formality for him, but that's really the nuts and bolts of it transferring 246 square feet from one unit to the other yeah pretty straightforward is there a reason why we can't do these as simple lot line adjustments and not bring them to us per state law no we have to bring it to you it's a dumb law. Contact your legislature. It's a dumb law inside of a because project. Because it's a office. Because it's a condominium. Because it's a platted subdivision. Right. Okay. And believe me, we are getting more of them. So any so, change yeah. that they want to do to the interior of the building because each thing is separate mm -hmm. has to come. Before. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. Believe me, we would prefer yeah. it not. It does it makes, seem like a, it makes it, a now, business thing. So how do you said that though? If it's parcels, so not a lot, not a platted subdivision, if it's just parcels, we state law does allow us to do that administratively. So yeah. So we save you from some of the mm -hmm. situations. <laughs> but if it's in a platted subdivision, yes, you I get think to it's saving them, not us, but yeah. Right. Can I, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. So <laughs> This is on the second level, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and the first level is? Other offices. Other, other offices, offices yeah. yeah. This is just, yeah, this is just, I just showed you the second uh, floor, second level floor plans. The first one's almost identical, basically. So, 
So in a multi-story building, every level could have lots of yes. different configurations. Okay. Yes, if they if, condominiumize it. Yes, yeah, okay. yes. Um, people could individually own, however, one or more of those. Yes. If they want to make any changes, they would have to go through this. They to, if they want to make any physical changes, yes, right. So it wouldn't matter if the same person owned both of those units, both of those it, parcels. Actually, in this case, he does own both of them. You still um, have to Reg go. Reg Hintzy. Uh, yes, because it, it it is platted for the structure, not owner, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So even though it's the same owner, it, it makes no difference when it's in But how we all see that it's a little bit. The process might be too robust for the situation. <laughs> yes. All, but then it does. The benefit, possibly, is to look at the sprinklers and fire alarm systems, which an owner might not look at otherwise, maybe. Yeah, true. If they're changing, uh, well, plus if it was a bearing wall, we definitely wouldn't want them to do that. You know, they'll have to go through the building department. <laughs> so, yeah, um, right. So, that yeah, that comes up too. Yep. All those issues. Yep. Okay. Any other questions about this agenda item? Okay, um, agenda item six is a two lot subdivision um, on Jefferson Street. Yeah, so this one um, is mine. This is uh, for 6571 and 6575 uh, South Jeff Jefferson Street. This is a request for two flag lot subdivisions, but they're contiguously next to each other, which the code does allow, as long as you have 38 feet of access going down um, the flag um, portion of the, of the lots. So it, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, each of these, uh, they will meet all the regulations for flag lots, which require that the back, the, the flag portions are a 125% of the what the zone requires. So that would be 10,000 square foot lots. The, uh, all of the lots will be over 10,000 square feet. So we don't have any potential issues there. Um, really, that's mostly it. So, I mean, it's pretty straightforward that you guys did hear this once before, um, over a year ago, and they never recorded the plat. So they're back to actually do so it this time. So remind me, when they came before, and I probably should have looked at this, did they have this one driveway? Yes. That was the plan before? Yep. So unusual. Yeah, yeah. they couldn't go onto the other private road. They couldn't front onto the private road. That's correct. So that's why they had to okay. do flag lots. Yes. That's, I couldn't remember exactly. I yep. was like, I'm sure there's a reason that the driveway's like this. But. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Yeah, they, they went through this once before and had they pretty much just brought us the exact same materials they, and gotcha. said, and change the date on the application. So that's pretty much it. So they're, they're two separate lots, so they both have to have separate driveways. Is that it? No. No, they all, they all, so the, the two front lots have their own. Two back lots. Yeah, the two back lots will share the same. Like um, the double sized driveway. The, right, it exactly. Comes off Lester, does it have Probably to be a right. double sized driveway? So each of them basically has their own driveway. Each of the flag lots has their own driveway. It's almost like Kay. a cul-de-sac without a turnaround. It, it, yeah, that, it's more like, yeah, more like a cul-de-sac without a turnaround. So yeah, the, the, even though, yes, it will, they technically could say that, yes, they have a driveway on both. In, in all intents and purposes, it's going to be, remain open. Um, it's not gonna be like fenced off there or anything like that. I kind of asked that because one of the diagrams, I don't know what page it is. Um, well, it's on a couple of my yes. Um, they show the lot line and the driveway on one side is, looks bigger, wider than the driveway on the other side. Yes. So it's kind of like they're, they're still sharing some driveway between those two lots they yeah so it will all be a shared driveway across all four lots they will all share that that access easement and be allowed to use it in perpetuity but it'll be a public road who will maintain it no it, it, it'll be the property owner's oh. responsibility so to maintain it, it. my question is still the same could it simply be one driveway versus two that's what it is it, it is it, one it, extra wide driveway. Yeah. Yes. Yes. One, yeah. one leg lot, it'd only be half as big. Right. For the most part, yes. Well, it'd all be on one property. 
It would be, yes. But then it would only be allowed one lot. Only one flag lot would be allowed. It's, it's, it's like a common drive. That's, that's what it is, common shared driveway. And in fact, it specifically is shared um, amongst them all so that someone can't put a fence down in the middle of the road. Well, I, or, I know it's shared. I'm just saying, yeah. could they share it with half of it on one of the front lots and half of it on the other it's lot? As a, so, Instead of 30 feet oh, or gotcha. whatever it okay. is. Uh, now, it's it, now it's starting to make a little more sense. Um, so um, the reason why it, they it, it's situated the way it is is because lot two is going to have the, that house remain. So that house will continue to be there. So that's why the lesser of that is on that portion um, where lot one is going to have the existing dwellings demolished and then that's going to become its own new buildable lot. Okay, still same same question, but I don't. <clears throat> yeah. Could they cut it in half? They could. Make I, it half as wide. Oh. N the driveway. It's no. It's still a shared driveway. No, our, our regulations require that it's 38 feet. So if it was on, if they had enough width on their property to do it on the other side of the of the house and still stay within the property lines, it would still be 30 feet. Well, here, how about this, Zach? If there was only going to be one flag lot, then they couldn't do it because it has to be 38 feet. No, no it would have to be 20. Feet. It would have to be 28 feet at that point. If it's so two shared. Have it 28 feet with only 28 versus more. Because the code tells us no. Does it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, yes, I would be all for I, that. I'm just no, yeah, for that. sure. I totally understand that. And I would love, I would love and that. There's no reason for in some ways, 30, 19 lots, feet of asphalt yeah. on both sides. That just seems the question exorbitant. Really came up because one drive, one, the side of that shared driveway on one side is narrower yeah. than the other side. Sure. So. Yeah, the code doesn't allow us to to vary that that All right, width. Bad jury so. <laughs> okay. No, it's I think it's a good question I don't because think, they could have developed this in different ways. Right? Yeah. Uh, they couldn't yeah. have. And I don't think you're badgering them anymore. They're going to badger each other on who's going to be responsible for shoveling <laughs> yeah. the driveway. Right. It's a it's tricky gonna, situation yeah. for sure. Sorry. So the fact that the oldest kids, the oldest kids, I like that. Oh, Until they leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right, this. Thank you. Um, subdivision just never got recorded mm -hmm. so they're back again and yep. so say they don't record for you know two years go by or whatever they can just keep reapplying yeah yeah technically right yeah. until they technically yeah once it's recorded though right then the time like a timer starts yeah. right okay but once the subdivision is approved they have one year to record it okay and if they don't they can apply to have a, another one year extension as as if they apply before it expires. Why didn't they last time? That was going to be my question. <clears throat> and they didn't. In fact, we've had, this is the third one that's done that. Mm -hmm. um, technical problems, community problems, or is it just? I think COVID just shot a lot of people down. Uh, the applicant might be able to respond more on it um, tonight, but um, I think COVID just shut everything down and they just, you know, whatever. So now they're trying to revamp. For, and so they wanted to, re, uh, to come back and record it. And we okay. said, uh, your year's up. In fact, your two years are up because they uh -huh. did get a one-year extension. So, yeah, they had to reapply and okay. go through this process all over again. Yeah. It would have been a lot cheaper to build the houses two years ago. And I also think, <laughs> um, I, I can't specifically speak for the applicant, but I think also part of it was the Fashion Place West small area plan. They were waiting to see what came of that. Um, and because this is within that area, um, so they wanted to see what that brought with it. Um, and that that's another reason why they kind of held on to see if there was something that You're they might be able like, to do more. I see. They yeah. could, they might have read based on what the small area plan said, maybe redevelop or do a different plan. Correct. Gotcha. 30 story building. So a little yeah. high density housing. <laughs> a little more follow up on Marin's question. So um, their um, application to us expired, but application or, or the hearing officer doesn't have to hear it again either. So that no variances are forever. granted for imperfect forever. To the property, right? right? Yeah, Is to the uh, yeah, recorded against the property and granted forever. Even if nothing happens to it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes, I was going to say a good example of that, and you'll see this next meeting is a variance that was granted in 94, 96. Nobody acted on it, and lo and behold, we get an application for someone that wants to act on that oh, and wow. split the property. And it's like, Even wow. Though probably lots has changed since. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yes, it stays with, the variance stays with the property. Interesting. Yes. And that's because that's the state law, or? Uh, yeah. Variances once go once with, you have oh, a variance, it's forever. Okay. Okay. It belongs to the property and not the property owner. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, you'll see that next next meeting. Part of that's why it's so cri or strict to get a variance. There's, like, really defined criteria to get a variance. It's hard. Makes sense. Okay. Any other questions about Jefferson Court subdivision? All right. Um, then, I, unless you have any other questions or discussion, I'll close the staff review meeting um, until our regular meeting at 630. Okay. Okay, I will call to order the Murray City Planning Commission meeting for Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. It is 6.30 p.m. Uh, present this evening are commissioners Jake Pearson, Jeremy Lowry, Travis Nate, Lisa Malkiewicz, Ned Hacker, and Sue Wilson is joining us on Zoom. I am the chair, Marin Patterson. Uh, from staff tonight, we have uh, Zachary Smallwood, Susan Nixon, and GL Critchfield is here with us. As the chair of the Murray City Planning Commission, I, Marin Patterson, have determined that due to infectious disease COVID-19 novel coronavirus, holding an in-person meeting with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those in attendance. Under these circumstances, Utah Code 52-4-2074 allows for electronic meetings to be held without an anchor location, so long as the public has had an opportunity to view the meeting and submit public comments. We are holding tonight's planning commission meeting via video conference, and the meeting is being live streamed at www.murraycitylive.com. If you have a public comment to submit to the planning commission, please do so via email at planningcommission at murray.utah.gov. So we will begin our agenda items with our business items tonight. Um, our first item, approval of minutes. We do not have any minutes yet from our last meeting. So we will move on to uh, agenda item number two, conflict of interest. Do any of the commissioners have a conflict of interest with any of the agenda items tonight? No. 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 And I didn't hear from Sue, but I'm guessing now. <laughs> All right. I don't either. So there, as far as I know, are no conflicts of interest for our meeting. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I think we're still muted, you know. Okay. Is that better? Are we unmuted now? Okay. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Great. <laughs> what does that mean for the record? Do we need to repeat any of the information from the beginning or? It's your opinion. Is it in the recording? We're okay. We're okay. okay. We will move on. We had already done agenda item number one and number two while we were muted, but we will move on to agenda item number three then. Uh, approval of findings of facts. Um, there are four findings of facts, um, Three Swords Forge, Fashion Place Mall, and Larry H. Miller Group, Bamberg Residential Infill Subdivision, and Spring Creek Cove Residential Infill Subdivision. Have the commissioners had an opportunity to review the findings and facts and conclusions? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, it, I will entertain a motion to approve those. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the findings of fact for a conditional use permit to Three Swords Forge to allow a metal fabrication business on the property located at 4637 South Cherry Street. A motion to approve the findings of fact for a conditional use permit to allow auto inventory storage by Mark Thorson and Greg Flint, representing Fashion Place Mall and Larry H. Miller Auto Group, on the property located at 6011 South State Street, and a motion to approve the findings of fact for a conditional use permit for Allen Prince, Monterey Properties, LLC, to allow a residential infill subdivision on the property address 344 East, 5600 South, and a motion to approve findings of fact 
for a conditional use permit for Jacob Ballstead representing Garbett Homes to allow residential infill subdivision on the property addressed 5091 South Wesley Road and 5070 South 1100 East. Thank you. I had a motion from Commissioner Wilson. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Aye. All right, motion passes. We will now move on to our conditional use permit um, agenda item number four. Uh, Kathleen Gerwick and Ingenuity Inc. for applying for a conditional use for a tattoo shop. Um, is the applicant with us on our Zoom yeah. meeting? Yes. Yes. All right, great. We will first have our staff report then. Thank you. This application is for Ingenuity Inc. for conditional use approval to conduct a tattoo business at the property at 150 West 4800 South, unit number 29. The property is located in our MG manufacturing zone. It's at the north end of a industrial park that is accessed off of 4800 South. Um, the applicant um, is requesting to lease 585 square feet of office space and at the north end. And there are, on the uh, slide up above, you can see that there are five parking stalls adjacent in front of the unit number 29. The proposal is for two rooms, a waiting room and a tattoo procedure room, and then a restroom. She is planning to be the only artist at this time, but may potentially have another artist there. So the requirements for a tattoo shop are for three stalls for, for each unit or workstation, um, artist, I guess you could say, and one stall for every 250 square feet for office space. So the total required for this particular application would be four, and there are five parking stalls that are designated as hers. Um, the property, a couple of uh, pictures here. The upper picture has three parking stalls right in front of unit number 29, and the lower one has the two parking stalls across the drive aisle that are also reserved for her. The ADA stall is in front of the overhead door, as you can see, and that is not allowed by our code. So um, as noted in the staff report, she will either need to block that off or move the ADA stall elsewhere. Um, there's only one stall for every 25 parking stalls required for code, so it could be shifted somewhere, um, but or convert one of the other ones possibly across the aisle to maybe be an ADA stall. So we would have to work with her on that. Um, we sent out notices to 17 surrounding uh, property owners, did not receive any public comment whatsoever. And so staff is recommending approval based on the following conditions. And a couple of them might be a little bit duplicated somewhat. And I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for... I did have one question. I know number nine on the condition says no more than two booths. Um, so with the five stalls, that's factoring in the parking for the two booths? No, that's actually a good question. That's only for, for one. So if there were actually two booths, you would have to come up with, I think, uh, let's see, six, seven, two more stalls. Okay, so... Uh, oh, actually, no, because the, the office space would go away. So it would have to be one more stall. So you have to have six total. Yeah. It was a requirement four and she has five, so it would be it would one be more. So so it's one stall for every um chair. Chair, yeah. Um and one stall for every two hundred and fifty square feet. But if an artist were to take the place of the office space, so that would be two chairs, that would be a total of six stalls. And it's she, unchanged if, if both chairs are in the same room. Um, it's a big enough room. I think yeah. you could easily fit two tables in there. Yeah, well, you know, our code it, is specific on the chairs, you know, Bottom. chairs, workstations. I've forgotten exactly the wording, but it is based. Same with beauty barber shops, same type of thing. Right. It's based on the number of chairs. Which so. makes sense because that's how many clients plus yeah. the people are doing it. Um, so, how exactly, you know, when, if, or if she has an, another artist, what is her process of coming back and getting, does it change her conditional use? Does it change her how many parking nope, spots she, she has? She would just have to show us that she has access to six stalls um, somewhere on the property. I don't, 
because it does say um, that you can have up to, that there may be two, so that would equal six. She would have to just show us there's another par parking spot okay. somewhere on the property that's designated for her. So she could just come in and work that out with staff. Yeah, and that would be handled through business licensing. Business licensing gets a copy of our, our report and our conditions of approval. And so when the, an applicant comes in to apply for that, they check that to make sure that they have what it is. And if they're adding another artist, then they would be licensed yeah, too. We would have to somehow work it out. And with those them. spots that are across, is she able to like label them for her? Like, you know, say these are Ingenuity Inks spots or would, because they're kind of not all contiguous, you know? True. Um, I would imagine, but it would probably be up to the she property work, owner. Okay. She'd have to work something out with them and maybe put a sign or something that says designating to her. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Can you refresh our memory? How often does the applicant have to reapply for the business license? Is it yearly or yearly? Yearly. yearly. And it's based on when they're approval. So if she gets approval, say, you know, next week, it would be renewed next June. So, so, yeah. so it's frequent enough that if she were to add another artist, it would be easy for her to, it wouldn't be in five years and she'd have to come reapply within that five year license. It's every year. So it's often enough that it's likely. She yeah. Can. Well, and if another artist came in, when they would apply, that would kick in this review. So it's not necessarily her renewing. If someone else, you know, another artist came in, they have to get their own license. So, okay. Yeah. Great. Any other questions for staff? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, would the applicant then, um, do you need them to raise their hand or do you, yeah. Can you click raise the hand button? And then when you are unmuted, we would just ask for you to state your name and address for the record. I hope I did that right. Yep. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, it, my name's Kathleen Gerwick. And then would you state your address for us? Um, the address to my house? Um, any address is fine. Okay. <laughs> 2920 Adams Street, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84115. Great. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, have you had a chance to review the 10 uh, conditions for your application? Yes, I have. And will you be able to um, comply with those conditions? Yes, I can. Great. Is there any additional information that you would like to give us regarding your application? Um, I have spoken with the shop that uses the overhead doors and I asked them how frequently they use them and they said they don't really use them, that that door remains locked for the majority of the time. The only time they end up do using it is for a delivery and they would communicate that with me beforehand as it's scheduled. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference when it comes to the ADA uh, space right there that it's not really used. Um, another thing um, that I did speak with them about was the parking spaces. If I did end up getting another chair in my space they have two more parking stalls over there that I am able to use. Oh, great. Wonderful. <clears throat> um, yep. As far as her ADA stall, condition number five, um, in front of that overhead door, even though they don't use it, it, she would still need to comply with that condition. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think we would have, somehow that would have to be, we would have to be satisfied. With the fact okay. That so yeah, you can, not I would just recommend you work with staff to maybe, um, I know they're not using that door, but I think that, yeah, being in front of the overhead door, they, you need to find a new spot. So, um, okay. yeah, feel free to work with staff about maybe what would be a better spot for that spot. Um, okay. All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, now we are going to open the meeting for public comment regarding this agenda item. Uh, if you would like to make a public item, comment, you may do so by emailing planning commission at murray.utah.gov. Or um, if anyone registered for the Zoom, did we have any live comments that uh, no registered? Okay. So we will leave the public comment portion open for a minute to receive any emails about this agenda item. Sorry, I didn't... 
I didn't mean not to look at you when I was doing that. No. We, we did have an email Fine. come in, but it wasn't for this item. So I was You're juggling to- <laughs> multiple hats, so no worries. <laughs> Okay, any new emails? All right, I will close the public comment period then and open it for any discussion amongst the commissioners or a motion. I'd like to have a real quick discussion about the wording on condition number four. I don't think it would change the applicant's ability to comply, but um, and I don't know if it's significant for this item, but I think it's something we should start considering for all certain most items like this. Um, item number four says the applicant specifies that the applicant is responsible for that item. And I, I'd be more comfortable if we just didn't identify who's responsible for it and just said shall strike parking to clearly identify the required parking stalls so that it can be negotiated. If, if we didn't identify a person, then wouldn't both parties assume they're not responsible? Where if we identify the applicant, the applicant then is responsible and they go back to the property owner and say, I want you to do this or I'm not going to lease the space. We've had a lot of discussion about this in the past where the property owner refuses and is trying to get the applicant to pay for it with bigger projects. And I think by not identifying who's responsible, they can hash it out. If the applicant feels like they have no problem parking too. But as it's written, parks. isn't it more specific? And so we're actually identifying who is responsible to do it. But legally, they aren't. Legally, is the applicant responsible legally? I think so. Otherwise, they can't comply with the condition, the conditions. And if or the they can't owner comply is with it, the conditions, then they can't get the conditional use permit. Or the right? owner is responsible, or they can't have a um, uh, someone in their facility unless they maintain the code. I mean, that's a. Is it for us to argue or just let them work it out as long as it's done? Yeah, I do think that we have encountered, not necessarily with parking, but a lot of landscaping or other things that that we are, the property owner is usually the one that would be funding some of those changes or bringing them within code, um, but we're using this application as a way to have them meet our city standards. Um, so I, I do think that just stating that it needs to be done and not delineating who is the responsible party um, is a way to make it a more neutral requirement. Um, If I could comment on your application in your packet, there is behind the owner's affidavit, there is a owner certification form that where where there are multiple units in a park, like is exactly the case. This, by the owner signing this, this does say that they will bring the property into compliance. And could I ask um, a, a question? Is, isn't this is this would be a wouldn't this be a code enforcement item? Yes. In the yes. in the ultimately, a property owner has to maintain the uh, the their property in compliance with the. But if it's the, the owner's responsibility and the affidavit that they're signing identifies that, are we contradicting ourselves by saying the applicant is responsible in the condition? Isn't it just more accurate not to list someone or to list the owner, or because we don't want to get in the middle of it, not list who? Or we could list both. I, I, you know, I think, like you said, we've had this conversation numerous times. Right. Ultimately, the property owner is is responsible to have their property be in compliance. But the mechanism for us to bring it into compliance is a conditional use. And often I feel like we're putting the onus on the applicant when actually the onus really is on the property owner, but we don't have a specific way to say get into compliance other than this application. Right? But so. aren't they in compliance right now without this application because we're only adding the additional parking stalls because of the application? No, the ADA strikes out. The ADA, I think, is the question. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I just... But we don't have a way to, I mean, other than you know, these situations, try and get some of these older, you know, or out of compliance things up to our code. Yeah, I I understand that. I'm just saying that um, because of this application, we're requiring more parking stalls. Not not more. No, Uh, the issue I think is the the location of the ADA stalls. So So are you only talking about the ADA stall and that's all? Or are you talking about this restriping of the parking lot? You know, I, I'm talking in general for this item and other items in the past and the future, but this is this specific item and they're going to have to restripe. And I, I, we've had other items where the owners come back and said, well, the affidavit, uh, 
affidavit says I'm responsible, but this legal document says they're responsible. I want them to pay. And I don't know if we're contradicting ourselves by saying that. Well, sometimes in, depending on their contract, I, and I can't speak for it, but if the owner and the, and the applicant or leasee um, have in their contract, you know, that they do any re improvements that's, you know, beyond our purview, That's why, so. that's another reason why we wouldn't call anyone out. Yeah, just right, right. Whatever you're, just make it more generic as the property shall be blah, 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 restriped or whatever, right? I think the, the, the at issue here is the, the property owner in this case is not the applicant, it's the, it's the tenant. And so unless we wanted to have a situation where we have a co-application with a property owner and a tenant, we we're asking somebody who hasn't applied and we could ask the city attorney, but in my view, we've, we're at, we've, if we, if we were to, if we were to leave it ambiguous or if we were to add the, the property owner into it, we're asking somebody who has not applied for a conditional use permit to comply with, to, to, to comply with our terms for something they have, that they have not applied for. That is what we're asking them to do. <laughs> that is so, what we want. But, Don't these terms, we're just asking them to be in compliance with the ordinance. But the, but in, in the, situ but the situation is, I think, I think if, if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm this tenant and I, and I come to, I come to this meeting and they say, great, you need to do X, Y, and Z for the, for the property to meet code. I go to the landlord and say, okay, here's the list of stuff that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I, what you're saying is landlords are pushing back and saying, no, it's your responsibility. And I think that at that point, you know, that's where I would say, that's where, I mean, my, I, I do, do using deductive reasoning, I would say, well, you own the building this is the code, you're out of code, I guess I'll just go, I guess I'll call code enforcement and they'll come and tell you to do it. But that's why I, Does feel, that make, I, mean, that's that's like, why I feel like what happened if we... And that's kind of what made, what, it makes Susan's point valid there, is that the, the owner of the building, we make them sign something saying that they are aware that somebody is going to be going through this conditional use permit process and there will be conditions and and that they will have to conform with those so they are aware that this is going to they should be aware they should read things what is, what before does the language they specifically say in that document as it, the owner of the property being considered for site plan review and conditional use permit i will comply with section 17.76.180 as specified above yeah, it's it's within your packet. It's right there. Um, I I don't know yeah. the page number. Yeah. Right after that. Yeah. So then, so, so then I go back to I feel like we are sticking our toes in the legal issues and getting in people's way by specifying who should when we don't really know who should. Well, I mean, I think, I think, Lisa, I think, it's, I think, it says right on that owner's um, certification form that they say that they will make that they will comply. And so it doesn't really matter if the tenant pays for it or if the landlord pays for it, they've both agreed that they will abide by the conditions that we set for. So I think we're covered and, either way. And I think that in, if, I think if it's, a, is, it the, is the concern that the landlords are being mean to the tenants or that, I mean, are they're not being unfair to, to tenants? Is that the, is that- They're the passing the buck. The, yeah. Uh, they're not they're bringing their thing into compliance because it's calling out the applicant shell. Okay. So we're trying to make a more neutral way of saying this is the expectation. However, it's met is doesn't matter necessarily. I mean, would it, would it, what is it just, this is a brainstorming session at this point. So yes. what, what, <laughs> what, what about something saying, you know, the building as mm -hmm. present, this building does not meet um, our, does not meet Marie, current Murray city codes for it to be brought up to the code. This is what must be completed. I think that's I mean, what these conditions that, are. I mean, but, but, and, and so not saying, not saying the applicant or the landlord just call it's just saying you do, this is out of compliance. Well, just like number four, just say shall be yeah, to clearly just, identify the required parking stalls and don't put anyone's name there. Just say you shall. They shall. So we shall. There's been other issues. In, I mean, this specific one, but like landscaping is a big one. Landscaping is very expensive and property owners often do not want to up upgrade their landscaping to allow one tenant in their, mm -hmm. in their building. So, you know, they, they sign the certification, but sometimes they aren't as willing to do that. You know, this is a small restriping. This is a much larger conversation, but I think, you know, maybe, making a more neutral statement about what needs to be accomplished doesn't go against the actual how it 
our actual conditions of bringing up to code. Are there any other thoughts? Well, an, yes, an yeah. ADA sign is, is $20. It can be put on the parking space next to the one where it currently is, and they can put that sign right, mount that sign right to the building, you know, have somebody come and stencil the ADA um, insignia on the ground and, and they're, they're good to go. It's not going to be a real expensive process for them. And I think the um, conclusion and the recommendation, as well as the owner's affidavit, you know, have got us covered, you know, really well for this. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't think this particular uh, restriping or fixing the, the parking um, is going to be hard. It's just who is responsible for doing it before it, before she can get her business license, it needs to be done. If her landlord does not comply, what recourse does she have? Don't rent the property. That's that's I mean, it. It's, she can. It's a it's a free market. She can walk away and no. and not. But making it more neutral doesn't have any negative impact on her or or any applicant and their and their business I mean, with their owner, property owner. Yeah, I mean, ultimately you would think that the property owner will benefit from having a tenant that will pay rent in, in a property. And you would think you would think that a business is going into a property they think is commercially viable. And so I mean, as part of their lease, they should negotiate with each other. Right. It's much bigger discussion than we need for this particular item, but we're talking about, I guess, items in general, because like the ax throwing um, applicant that was there on state street across from fashion place mall, the, the landlord didn't want to put in landscaping. It was trying to get the applicant to pay for landscaping. And one of the options when we do that was if we decide not, to push the issue and let them make it appear as if it's the applicant, then the owner could tell the applicant, I'm not interested in you. I'm going to wait until another um, business comes that doesn't require a CUP and it doesn't have to go in front of the board and mm -hmm. I don't have to bring my place up to the ordinance. Well, so, then, so. then why wouldn't we just refer, is, then, well, I mean, I think if there, if, if it's, if the landscaping isn't, if it's not up to code, why wouldn't code enforcement go in and enforce the code? Uh, and, 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 they, uh, like, we, well, we don't have the mechanism just right because there's a lot of properties that are older and non-conforming, meaning they ha they haven't well, it, they haven't it, had a change. It's in front of us now. This is the mechanism. Well, but, right. So this is that's the why we're this saying yes, yes to get it into compliance. when we yes. make these conditions. Right. Well, okay. Make them more neutral in the future. Well, I, I, and so you're, you're, what you're saying. So wait, wait, so I'm sorry. I'm 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 newer to the to the commission. So. So what you're saying is that there, you feel like there's there are some businesses that would receive pre preferential treatment or would be or, or or it could be discriminated against based on their having to come before this committee um, because of that. Okay. And for that reason, I mean, just to take out the identifier is no big deal. There's no negative to it. it might be a positive, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, if it was a permitted use and not a conditional use, they, you you wouldn't see it, yeah, and they wouldn't right. have to necessarily not. Always, but most of the time, they would not have to um, bring it up to compliance unless there are extenuating circumstances. But typically, no, they wouldn't have to. I so. think this works ninety nine point nine percent of the time yes. as it is. Yes, I mm -hmm. do. I think that there's you're going to have that rare property owner that's going to cause problems, mm -hmm. and you're going to have that rare applicant that's just I refuse to do it. You're going to have to do it, and the beauty of it is that applicant can walk away. Like like has been suggested, they can find another property that uh, with an owner that wants their property to be viable, to remain viable, and not just be you know a, a, an abandoned building. But they've gone through the process. They've paid for this application. They've you know. So I think that protecting them, yeah, it does protect both parties. It's not just saying okay, well, good luck and find your own business. It's saying you do have some recourse if your property owner is refusing to do this and trying to put it back on you. Obviously, this is a much bigger conversation. So unless yeah, there's any yeah. further comments, I think we could maybe move towards a motion. Maybe I apologize for making the conversation. <laughs> and I'd like the record to show that I didn't break the mic that is now broken. <laughs> okay. Mic drop. Well, I'll be happy to make a motion to approve um, a conditional use permit to allow the operation of a tattoo shop on the property addressed at 150 West, 40 Inner South, Unit 1029, subject to the, the, the 10 conditions listed below. I'll okay. second. I have a motion by Commissioner Lowry and a second by Commissioner Nay to approve the conditional use permit to allow the operation of a tattoo shop on the property addressed 150 West, 4800 South, Unit 29, subject to the 10 conditions. Any discussion on the motion? All right, then we can take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Lowry? Yes. Commissioner Nay? Yes. 
Commissioner Pearson? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Milkevich? Yes. Commissioner Hacker? Yes. And Chair Patterson? Yes. Um, motion passes. Your conditional use is approved. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Ms. Gerwick. And if you have any thank other you. questions about your ADA spot, please reach out to, to staff and work that out with them. So thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to agenda item number five. Um, Reg, is that how you say it? Reg Heinz and Red Rock Winchester requesting a condominium subdivision amendment and lot line adjust it, adjustment for the property address 746 East Winchester units number 220 and 230. Is the applicant on our meeting tonight? Great. We will have our staff report first. Thank you. Yes, this application is from Reg Hintzy regarding um, a condominium subdivision amendment for the Red Rock Winchester office condominiums located at 746 East on Winchester Street. The property is in our C, uh, G, GO general office zone and on about just under two acres. Um, the Planning Commission approved the condominium the property split it into a subdivision back in 2018 and the applicant is now returning to modify a common wall between units which the units are considered lots in this case basically because it's a condominium plat so any amendments to subdivision plats require the land use approval based on state code and murray city code um, the property is simply, the, the proposal is simply just to shift 264 square feet from one unit to the other. Um, the applicant owns both of, the, both of the spaces, and his intention is to eventually sell unit number 220 to a uh, prospective buyer, and he will maintain unit 230. Oops. Here's a couple of photos of the property. Um, from all angles, the front, back, both sides. The building's quite big. I was actually surprised when I saw it. It's two, two levels, so the floor plans that you have seen are just the second level. There are also offices on the first uh, level. And let's go back to this again. So the area that's highlighted in red is, is actually the common wall or the lot line that we are proposing to change. The applicant also has submitted um, the amended plat, um, which will be reviewed in further detail with our engineering division prior to recording. And the applicant also submitted the updated uh, declaration with the um, conditions and outlining the changes for the CCNRs. Um, so he's kind of done all his homework and submitted all the information. And therefore staff is, based on all the information, the staff is recommending approval for the lot line boundary line adjustment to units 220 and 230 based on the following conditions. Great. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Uh, any questions for staff about this application? Okay. Um, then if we could have the applicant uh, click raise their hand. And we'll just have you state your name and address for the record. Okay. Um Reg Hintzy, um, 7612 Heart of Circle, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, I'm the, I was actually the original applicant and the declarant when we kind of minimized this building a couple of years ago. Um, oh, okay. Open for any questions, I guess. Great, yeah. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, were you able to review the conditions of approval for this application? Yes, I yes, I was able to review them. And you'll be able to comply with those? Yes, yes, Great. we'll comply with those. Is there any additional information that you would like to give us about this request? Um, just, uh, I mean, you guys got most of it covered. The two spaces in question are kind of, the last two units in the building that haven't sold to anyone. I am still the declarant of the condominium association. I'm ready to turn it over to the owners 
kind of when they're ready to take it over, I guess. And um, the space, the two spaces in question, the two units in question, were actually one large unit, and we're just demising it. And we had planned to demise it in the previous way. And then when I had a buyer for Suite 220, he requested a little more square footage. So we just changed where the line's going to be. So the, the demising wall will go um, where, where we're currently going to record this now. Great. Thank you so much. With that, we will um, now open the meeting for public comment regarding this item. Um, if you would like to make a comment on this agenda item, you can do so by emailing planningcommission at murray.utah.gov. Uh, did we have anyone that registered to speak? Okay. Have we received any emails for this agenda item? No. All right. We will leave the email or the public comment open um, to get any emails for this um, item. We didn't receive any not uh, any public comment based on the notices that were mailed out to the adjacent property owners slash unit owners. Great. <laughs> Have we received any emails? All right. No. Then I will close the public comment period uh, for this agenda item and um, open it up for a discussion or entertain um, a motion. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion and a little monologue. Um, I make a motion that the Planning Commission approve uh, the request to amend units 220 and 230 of the Red Rock Winchester office condos, adjust the lot line between the properties address 746 East Winchester Street as presented in, and subjected to the following, or to the condition, the fall. How about conditions one through four? <laughs> and then for just a very brief monologue, uh, I'd like to address the city attorney. Um, when we have an opportunity to speak, uh, to the legislature, it would be really nice if we could have them consider this type of item so that it doesn't have to be come before a body like this, especially where the property owner owns both units. It really should be much simpler for the applicant than this. Thanks. Yeah, very straightforward. Do I have a second on Commissioner Nay's motion? I'll second the motion. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Nay and a second by Commissioner Hacker to approve the request to amend units 220 and 230 of the Red Rock, Red Rock Winchester office condos, adjusting the lot line between the properties address 746 East Winchester Street, um, subject to the four conditions in the packet. Is there any discussion on that motion? Okay, we can take a vote. Okay, uh, Commissioner Nay. Yes. Commissioner Hacker. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Melkiewicz. Yes. Commissioner Lowry? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes, and I agree with Commissioner Nay. And Commissioner Pearson? Yes. And Chair Patterson? Yes. So motion passes. Uh, congratulations and good luck with your project. Thank you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Okay. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number six. Um, Sean Barr and a preliminary and final subdivision for our two flag lots. Um, is the applicant on our, yeah, all right. We will have our staff report. Thank you so much, Chair Patterson. I appreciate that. Um, so as you said, this is a request from Mr. Sean Barr to take uh, the property 6575 and 6571 South Jefferson Street and create two flag lots off each of, well, two flag lots total. So the properties are located uh, in the south south central area of, of Murray, uh, south of Winchester Street and along uh, Jefferson Street here on the uh, left-hand side. And actually, f interesting little fact, this, the, the north parcel is actually 6575 and the one below it is 6571. So it's addressed very weird. So the addressing will be corrected um, with with this as well. So um, just a little bit of info there for you. So uh, it, this is in the R18 zone, uh, requires a minimum of 8,000 square foot lots. So the uh, Title 16, the subdivision ordinance requires that any subdivision um, of property to be reviewed and approved by the Murray City Planning Commission as the Land Use Authority. 
So we are doing that tonight. This actually came before you back in January, January 3rd of 2019 um, and was approved for preliminary and final. Uh, the applicant just had not gone and recorded and the time had come or I apologize, he received an extension in 2020. And then in 2021, that time had come and gone and um, we got a request to actually redo the subdivision at this point. So um, on the screen in front of you is just, is an, the existing conditions pretty much. So as you can see, there's existing outbuildings and existing home. These two are the existing homes here on the left side of the screen. The applicant is proposing to demo everything that is in red, so it's going to become pretty cleaned up. Um, also, this gravel and, and concrete, all of this will be demoed and completely cleaned up. So uh, setbacks and height standards in the R18 zone. So the, these two properties did receive a variance to the lot width. Typically it's 80 feet to the variance allows for, uh, is granted for the seven, for 75 feet. Uh, front yard setbacks are 25 feet. Side setbacks are eight, a minimum of eight feet for a total of 20 on both sides. Rear setback is 25 feet and height in this zone is 35 feet. So as I had mentioned, uh, lots one, three, and four, so we'll come up here. Lots one, three, and four will all become new buildable lots. The existing home on lot one will be demolished. Um, and then the two lots, lot three and four, will be created in to, to facilitate any new development. As part of the requirements for flag lot subdivisions, the back lots have to be 125% of the underlying zone. Um, so as I mentioned, that's 8,000 square feet as the, the minimum for a lot. So 125% of that is uh, 10,000 square feet. And these will be 10,000 square feet almost exactly. Um, and then lot one and lot two are both also going to be over 10,000 square feet. So that they're very much just staying pretty large lots in this area. Uh, the two flag lots will be accessed via this uh, 38 foot wide uh, access easement. Um, the, actually, I apologize, all four will be accessed off this 38 foot access easement that will be shared between the, or the maintenance of which will be shared between the four lots. I guess this showed that one of the Holmes was staying. I apologize. I got ahead of myself. So with that, we are recommending that the Planning Commission grant preliminary and final subdivision approval for the Jefferson Court subdivision subject to the uh, six conditions. Um, actually, one last thing to add. We did send out 47 notices uh, with it within proper. Wow. To residents within 300 feet of this property. Um, and we hadn't received any up until the beginning of the meeting. Okay, great. Uh, any questions for Steph? I, I have one question. The um, relocating the existing utility pole that's in the middle of the driveway that runs that pole runs along the whole street, mm -hmm. and it is it looks like it's got four different utilities on it, possibly power, and I'm assuming cable, internet, whatever. Mm -hmm. So will they have to go down underneath and then back up? How will that work since that's a, a line down the entire streetway? That's a great question and something that I don't have the answer to. They will have to be, they'll have to work with um, the existing, with our public works and with the power department and determine how that's going to be. I would assume that probably just if, if, if I were betting, I would, I would assume they're just going to physically create a new pole further down the road and not underground it. They said in the application, I think that they were going to bury. Okay. Then there you go. I apologize. I then. think <laughs> you see that. Yeah, yeah. But I think they were burying the lines. So there's lines going from the streetway on right the to the property. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that's probably, they'll probably bury the utilities 
on those four lots, mm -hmm. but uh, which they will do. But that one pole will probably still be in existence and just be moved okay. further up or down the street at some point. Any other location? Any other questions? So I just the the I guess it's probably is it a private drive that John David Lane like right behind the properties? It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it that's was, why they're doing flag lots rather than just. Yeah, and, and we don't. The, our subdivision ordinance doesn't allow us to subdivide on private lane, private right, roads anymore right. either. Um, so yeah, that's one of the reasons that that is the main reason why they're doing it this way. Okay. Okay. Do you have a question? I I did, but I don't. I I noticed that the property to the north was still open. I thought maybe that'd be developed as part of it, but then I I've, I've since then learned it's Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, so it won't be. <laughs> so. Good for the homeowners. So, Zach, you said all four properties will access onto the new driveway. Correct. So will the two existing properties um, access to the street be closed? Um, currently, yes. So as you can see here, this all this X'd out area. We can't is, see your... Oh, you screen. can't see it anymore. Oh, can. there it is. Okay. Um, the X'd out areas are, are going to be demolished. So yes, they, they will then move into accessing off here. Good. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? All right. Um, if we could have the applicant uh, click raise their hand button on the meeting. And when you are unmuted, you can state your name and address for the record. Sorry, give me one second. No, that's no problem. Yeah, Sean's here. Okay, uh, Mr. Barr, you should be able to um, unmute yourself and speak. Hooray for Zoom technical yeah. difficulties. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, we'll give it just a second. Yeah, no problem. Because I had to, it, it's, it stated he was using an older version of Zoom and wouldn't let him just talk. So I okay. had to promote him to a panelist, which kind of ejects you from the meeting okay. and then brings you uh -huh. back in. So I'm not sure if maybe there's something happening there. Hmm. I guess. <laughs> If Ed Clarich can hear me, can you raise your hand and speak to the item? Um, we can try doing it that way because it doesn't look like Sean's thing is going to work. Oh, wait, here's a different way. Yeah, hi, sorry about that. My computer wasn't working. This is Sean Barr. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Barr. Thank you for being with us and waiting through those <laughs> uh, yeah, technical well, difficulties. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, so my name is Sean Barr and my address is 6571 South Jefferson Street, uh, Murray City, 84107. Great. Um, have you had an opportunity to review the conditions of approval for your preliminary and final uh, subdivision? Yes. And you'll be able to comply with those? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, is there any additional information that you would like to give us regarding your request? Uh, I can't think of anything. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for being with us. We will now open uh, this 
uh, agenda item for public comment regarding this. Um, if you would like to make a comment on this agenda item, you may do so by emailing planning commission at murray.utah.gov. Uh, did we have anyone that registered to speak a live comment? I don't think so. I'm not sure who this okay. person is. So I would just... If you would like to make a live comment uh, regarding this agenda item, you may click raise your hand button. Uh, if you're making a live comment, we ask that you uh, present new information and that you keep your comment to three minutes. So we did have an email item, right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I will go ahead and read the email item. Uh, this is from Amy R. She says, hi, I am not sure if I'm too late to submit comments for the meeting today. I am writing regarding the plan development on Jefferson Avenue. I believe at 6567 and 6571 Jefferson. I understand the housing crisis in Salt Lake County all too well, as I am a recent homeowner who moved against this property line in November last year. However, I am very worried about the traffic on Lester Avenue. We have cars who are exceeding the speed limit down this very straight road and there are no deterrents. If we begin to add more housing to the neighborhood, we need to think about traffic control. One of the reasons I bought this home was the large amount of children playing in the street. They are at high risk in this neighborhood. In addition, I would like to know what the rules are for how close structures are to the property lines. Will I have a big house directly on my fence? Okay, great. Have we received any additional email comments? Or anyone raise their hand to make a live comment? Okay. No. Then I will close the public comment portion. Um, is there anything you want to? Say yeah, to that I can. Comment? I can address some of some of uh, Amy's concerns. Um, we do. Uh, we do understand traffic. We, this isn't required to have a traffic study. This is pretty pretty much two new lots. Um, that doesn't rise to the level of needing a traffic study at this point. Um, however, the, there could potentially be more development down the line that looks at that. Um, also, the Fashion Place West Mill Area Plan did address traffic areas and, and some mitigations for that, you know, potentially installing sidewalks. We're actively looking into that now, um, seeing what might be needed or required for that area and what might need to happen to do that. Um, regarding the um, structures on property lines, I kind of went over the, the setbacks required. Uh, um, I'm not sure about um, Amy's a location, where what her setbacks are, but we do require at least eight feet on one side and typically 12 on another or 10 and 10. So you do have that adequate buffer in, in the R18 zone. So, and that's just part of our code. Yeah, right? that's yeah, part so of that's our yep universal to that zone. Correct. Yeah, and if if, if I may, I'll, I'll share my screen one more time just to kind of give you an idea. Um, so those those dashed lines here, those are typically the setbacks um, for each development. So you will at least have, and it looks like they're requiring a ten foot public utility easement um, along that north property line. So you probably in all likely get a 10 foot at least from any structure. Uh, you used it earlier, but the height requirement or restrictions or limitations? Is, yeah, it's 35 feet uh, or um, no higher than two and a half stories. So it, it it won't be overly burdensome, but you could build a pretty tall house as well. But that that should coincide with other two-story houses in the neighborhood. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any um, further questions or discussion? Um, I would, I think just even the sidewalks. I know you mentioned, um, and she kind of specifically called out children in the street. And one of their conditions is to provide a sidewalk in the front of this property, which is bringing things more up to code, making the street a little bit safer to have sidewalks on that area. And hopefully, yeah, the rest of Jefferson will will get that as well. Um, if there's no further discussion, I'll entertain a motion. 
Madam Chairman, I'll make a motion that the Planning Commission grant preliminary and final subdivision approval for the Jefferson Court subdivision on properties located at 6571 and 6575 South Jefferson Street, subject to conditions one through six. I'll second. All right. I have a motion by Commissioner Hacker and a second by Commissioner Wilson to grant preliminary and final subdivision approval for the Jefferson Court subdivision on the properties located at 6571 and 6575 South Jefferson Street, subject to the six conditions in the packet. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right, then we can take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Hacker? Yes. Commissioner Wilson? Yes. Commissioner Pearson? Yes. Commissioner Lowry? Yes. Commissioner Milkevich? Yes. Commissioner Nay? Yes. And Chair Patterson? Yes. Um, motion passes. So um, your grant is request, your, your request is granted. <laughs> so you can move forward with uh, the subdivision. So thank you very much for being with us at our meeting tonight. And thank good you luck very much. On, your, on your project. All right. Um, is there any further business to bring before the commission? Um, I don't think so. We, we're got an okay agenda for the next one. So we're moving right along and that's pretty much it. You'll probably start hearing more about the, um, the mixed use stuff coming up. Um, that's working its way through departments right now. Jared and Melinda are very busy. That's another reason why Jared isn't here this evening. He, deserves a day off um, <laughs> yeah. he's working very hard on, on on all this so um yeah just be prepared to talk mixed juice coming up soon so what is the timeline for that a month um well i think he wants to have it as a discussion item for you guys on the next meeting um i think so i, I i'm not ham completely know what the time frame is but yeah so Okay, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn at 7.25. In a second. Second. All right, meeting is adjourned. Okay, thank you.